Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today, we'll be finishing up our three-part series entitled Tithing, with part three, Receiving the Blessing. As usual, I want to ask you to just stay with me and, uh, until the end and just weigh what it is that I have to say. Now that you have a new understanding of what tithe really is, let us talk about receiving the blessing. So please turn with me to the usual scripture, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more room. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed. Imagine that. Can anybody here use a blessing today? I'm sure we all could use a little blessing. Look at the first thing that God says after instructing his people to bring the full tithe into his storehouse. He said, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so huge that you will not have room enough for it. But check this out. The scripture advises us this. It says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Yet God says, Test me in this and see if I will not bless you so richly that you will have no more room. I will bless you so abundantly you have more than enough. Who would like to have all their needs met? Who would like to have more than enough? Of course, we all would. Everybody would. We all need our basic needs met. At least our basic needs. And God said he will certainly do that and he will do even more than that if you will only just just hold on to the relationship that you have with him. Now look at verse 11. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. God says that he himself will rebuke the devourer on your behalf and all your, your investments, all your businesses, whatever you put your money to will produce and bear and prosper. But you must, what, but, but what must you do to obtain that? Render unto God what is God's. If it belongs to God, then give it to God. Give it back to him. If it's praises, then praises. If it's honor, then honor. If it's worship, then worship God. If it's time, then give your time or some of your time back to God. If it's tithes, give back the tithes. If it's first fruits, then give first fruits. Give back to God what is God's. You won't have to do anything extra to obtain this. Nothing out of the ordinary. Just create and maintain your relationship with God and give Him what belongs to Him. But folks, especially the young church, get so caught up in pastors having nice things or driving nice cars that they just can't get past that. They even quit going to church because of it. But they have no problem buying the latest iPhone for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Yet the current CEO of Apple owns about 3.3 million shares of the company. That would make him a billionaire just on his shares alone. So why not feel disgusted about that? Why not boycott products by, made by Apple because the CEO has way too much money. The founders of Google are multi-billionaires with the net worth that places them in the top 10 richest people in the world. Have they stopped using Google? 
or Facebook or Twitter or any of those secular companies because their CEOs or their founders are just too rich and powerful? No, I doubt it. And let's do a quick comparison. These secular companies are the same companies that dominate our lives and is trying their hardest to subjugate the whole world's population. They're trying to put us into subjugation. Yet, we still, still buy their products. We still contribute to their wealth. Besides all of that, what they offer are only temporal things, temporal products, things that will not last. Well, on the other hand, pastors offer you salvation. They offer you life through the shed blood of Jesus. They offer things that will last. But these people would rather their money be going to, 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 to these people with temporal things. They, they don't have a problem increasing their wealth. While the pastors who actually bring life and offer things that will last forever ever, are barely making ends meet. And they have no problem with that. They feel like that's the way it should be. Jesus said for us to work for the eternal. He said for us to work for things that will last. Forget about those things that do not last. Those things that will soon pass away. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 through 21 says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus said for us to work for the eternal. Right there. If pastors and church leaders are working for God, and if God is their boss, so to speak, and he chooses to bless them with finances right here on this earth, now, here and now, because he's pleased with the work that they're doing, how can we, mere humans, be angry and upset with God who gives abundantly? All the gold in the earth belongs to God. All the cattle on a thousand hills are His. Even the crude oil that man pumps out of the ground, God created that and He owns that. Is it too much for Him then to give some of His finances to whom He chooses? Not only that, but most pastors who have a lot of money write books and make investments that earn them lots of money. So, should they not enjoy the proceeds of their labor? In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus told a parable about a master of a house who owned a vineyard. He said, he said that the master of the vineyard went out early in the morning to hire workers to work in his vineyard. After agreeing to pay them, each, each one of them a denarius for the day's work, they went into his vineyard and they started working early in the morning. Later that day, he went out several more times and, uh, and he went out at different times of the day and each time he went out, he saw men standing around doing nothing and he told them, hey, go into my, my vineyard and work and I will pay you what is right. Finally, about an hour before closing time, he saw more men standing around idle, and he said to them, You too, you go into my vineyard and work, and I will pay you also. Now I want you to notice this, Matthew chapter 20, verse 8 through 15. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, 
the last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge me my generosity? The master of the house said that the money is mine and I can do with it as I see fit. Who are you to tell me how to spend my money? Are you angry because I am generous with my money? My own money? Yet people still grumble if they see the man of God prosper. But who are you, O oh man, that you should be angry and grumble against God? Jesus said in Luke chapter 10 verse 7, The laborer deserves his wages. And Paul asked this question in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 11. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap immaterial things from you? In other words, if you are getting fed, you're getting spiritual food, is it too much for the feeder to reap a financial blessing from you? These things will last forever, that they are feeding you, that the pastors are feeding you, that the evangelists are feeding you. But some will say, there's nowhere in the New Testament that commands me to pay tithes. And that is true. The only mention of tithes in, in the, is in the book of Hebrews. But look at what Paul said to the Philippians. And you Philippians, yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Paul is not asking for money to make himself rich. He is content with what he had. He did not care whether he had an abundance or if he was in lack. This mighty, mighty man of God only thought and ambition was to preach the gospel, nothing else. He was not in it for the money. This phrase, I seek the fruit that increases to your credit, actually means I seek the profit that accrues to your account. In other words, Paul wanted them to store up treasure in eternity. You see, whenever you give to a prophet, you will receive a prophet's reward. Jesus tells us that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 through 42. He says, whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. You know, just a few weeks ago, a young man with his pregnant wife and his child were sharing the gospel in a rough Alabama neighborhood. When a mumbling young man, 17 years old, came up to him and shot him to death in front of his child and his wife, his pregnant wife. You know, there once was a time when preachers and evangelists were honored. They were given a place of honor and respect because they were messengers of God, because they worked in God's field. They worked on God's behalf. But today in America, Christians are hated. Christians are despised. But I, did, I digress. Let us go back to, to the Philippians. Look at what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church concerning the given spirit that the Corinthians had. Those Corinthians, the, or, or, or not Corinthians, but those Philippian Christians had. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. 
We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Paul was describing the grace that God had given the Macedonian church because of their generous heart. He said that they begged him for the opportunity to take part in the relief of the saints who were in a, in a famine at that time. Then Paul adds this. They didn't do it as we had expected. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then they gave themselves to us. Meaning, Paul was expecting them to give out of their, their regular tithes and offerings because of their widespread poverty. But no, they gave that first. Then they gave over and beyond the tithe to help the suffering saints in Jerusalem. That was something Paul admired and, and God respected and he blessed them for it. You know, if all church members would tithe and continue to, to tithe, the church would help, would be able to help those who are unemployed, those who are hurting, those who are down and out. It could feed the hungry, clothe the naked, care for the orphans and orphans and minister to the widows. But as it is, statistics says that only 5% of church goes tithe. Only 1.5 million people tithe out of the 247 million U.S. citizens identifying as Christians. 77 of the tithers give more than 10%. That means that the, that, that the majority, most of the 5% who tithe, have to give extra in order to try to pick up the slot of the 95% who don't. And guess what? That 95%, if something happens, they lose their job and they're starting to starve, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the church and they're going to expect to get help. And they probably will. If that church can afford it, if that church has, has the money, that church will help them. Another statistic says that if every Christian tithe 10%, faith organizations would have an extra $139 billion each year to do ministry with. Without tithes, there is no food in God's house. Churches don't just have the finances to help if nobody tithes. They don't have the finances to minister to the needy if nobody gives. But as Paul wrote, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 through 8, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. You need to be convinced in your own heart. But, but believe me, God will bless you for being faithful. Listen to this last story that I would like to tell, and then I'm finished. In his book, Tortured for Christ, Richard Warmbrand wrote, and I quote, when we were given one slice of bread a week and dirty soup every day, we decided we would be faithfully tithed even then. Every tenth week, we took the slice of bread and gave it to a weaker brethren as our tithe to the master. Richard Warmbrand was a Jew 
who lived in Romania in early 1900s. When the communist Russia overtook Romania, he was in prison for his faith. He was treated horribly and even tortured for the name of Jesus. They didn't have enough food to eat. Yet this man of God, along with his fellow prisoners, did not think it too much to tie the little that they had. They felt it was their duty and responsibility to give back to God what was God, even if it meant that they would have to do with less. They would have to do without. They chose not to steal from the Almighty. I thought that was so commendable that even under dire con conditions, these men of God chose to tithe the little that they had. They chose to do without. I hope that you will be convinced of the importance of tithing in your heart. And I hope that you'll be convinced of the benefits of tithing. Even if you don't benefit here on this earth, you're storing up treasures in eternity where you will reap a great reward. You know, I never like to end our time together without giving you the opportunity to accept Jesus as your personal Savior if you don't already know him as Lord and Savior. So if you would like to accept Jesus, here's how. All you have to do is to ask him. Follow me in this prayer and believe it with your heart. Confess it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart and the Lord will save you. Our Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me to be faithful in all I do. Help me to faithfully give and faithfully tithe. And Lord, rebuke the, the, devourer, the devourer on my behalf. Help me to prosper in what you give me, that there be no, no lack and no need in my house. Thank you now, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. I accept your free gift of life. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I suggest is you get yourself a Bible as usual. Read your Bible. Highlight the promises. Highlight the things of God that are meaningful to you. Commit them to memory. And when things go rough, when things are hard, remember those. Bring them to memory and quote the scripture. It will deliver you out of trials, out of temptations. Find yourself a Bible-believing church. A Bible-believing church that still believes that there's a way, a true way, and that the, the things of God are not things of past, but that there's still healing. There's still signs and wonders in his church. There's still, still miracles that happen in his church. Join that church. Don't join one of those progressive churches that anything goes and that they embrace the things of the world. Believe in righteousness, holiness. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. Pay your tithes in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that, that, that you should be doing. And he'll take you to be with him. That where he is, there you shall be also. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate that. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.